so great to be part of an organization like this. All of us who've been part of organizations like this know how important it is to our careers and our personal lives, not just professional or personal. So wherever you end up, you future mad men and future mad women, uh, and, and success and love to all of you, wherever you are, join an organization like this. It's just really important to your lives. And uh, anyway, I, I just got in last night, and I said to the driver, where's the Mississippi? And he said, it's over there, you can't see it. It was midnight, and I said uh, to Erin today, where's the Mississippi? And she said, it's over there, you can't see it. <laughs> and I'm, I'm leaving at five o'clock. Will someone please show me? <laughs> So I really know it's there. Um, uh, who will keep an eye, eye on the time? I understand you stop at one sharp, is that right? So Aaron, will you stand up and blow the whistle since you seem to be good at that, right? Um, okay. Uh, mad women. Um, there are three questions that everybody asks me about what it was like to work in advertising in the mad men era of the 1960s, that sexy, sexist era. They say, uh, were women really treated like second-class citizens? Did you guys actually have three martini luncheons every day? And then they lean forward and say very confidentially, was it all that much sex in the office? And I say, the answer to all three questions is unequivocally yes. <laughs> <laughs> Except that I do think that whatever you see on Mad Men, we did more of. <laughs> and I think we had a better talk to when you somehow. Anyway, the the very first very first interview I had, Mad Men, Mad Men was published on October, uh, I'm sorry, February the 28th, and the first interview I had was March the 1st, and it was on National Public Radio, and they told me the interviewer on NPR uh, was pretty, pretty tough, that he asked very, very difficult questions, and I was a little bit nervous because I thought, oh, he's gonna ask me tough questions about advertising, then and now, and everything, and I did my homework and prepared, and, it was a 30-minute interview, that's a very long interview, and I get into the studio, and for 29 of the 30 minutes, he asked me about sex in the office. <laughs> and I answered as well as I could, <laughs> and, um, and I, it was a pretty good interview. I, I knew it had gone well, and so I kind of waltzed down the corridors of NPR on my way out going, <laughs> And I walked past the receptionist at NPR, uh, and she doesn't even know I'm there because she's talking to a visitor. And the visitor is saying, who was being interviewed in there just now? And the receptionist says, I don't know who it was, but it's some old lady talking about sex. <laughs> and I said, simmer down. <laughs> but uh, because of mad men, and the media frenzy, remember Mad Men went off the air for 17 months because of some kind of uh, quarrel between the production company and the, the, the network, and people didn't know whether it was coming back, and would Don Draper still be alive, and what was happening, and so there was the media was just in a state of, they wanted to know everything, and so my book, published just a month, before Mad Men came back on the air, took off on the wings of this eating frenzy. And so I just was interviewed everywhere. I said to my daughters, uh, I got a rave review in the Times of London. The Times of London, I can now die happy. And they said, yeah, mom, the Times of London. But they think that I really made it finally in my life because I was interviewed in one week by the Daily Beast and the Huffington Post. <laughs> it's, it's nice that my children think I've arrived. <laughs> so anyway, I interviewed, oh, about 200 people uh, for this book, mostly women, but a spattering of men. And everybody I interviewed, I asked the obligatory question, tell me about sex in the office. Now you seem like a jolly crowd, so I thought I'd start this little talk about sex in the office, all right? 
applaud, please. <laughs> New York, 
hold on and said the date was perfectly fine. Thank you very much. Don breathed a sigh of relief. Case closed. A couple of weeks later, he came home from work. He tossed his briefcase on the bed. He said to his wife, oh, my paycheck's in the briefcase. Help yourself. He <laughs> <laughs> <You> got it. <laughs> his wife emerged from the bedroom with a copy of Screw Magazine with all the girls circling. <laughs> and the little comments, like a little rough. <laughs> and she says to him, you bastard. <laughs> and he says, no, 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 wait, wait, you don't understand. I did it for my client. <laughs> and she says, aha, and you're not only a bastard, you're also a pimp. <laughs> and, and Don says, they're still married, but to this day, he doesn't know whether she actually believed him or she just uh -oh. gave him a sweet story. I wish I could tell you who he is. He's very nice to him. Uh, I think he learned a lot to be uh, Well, so, so there, there, there was a lot of sex indeed going on, um, and there's more of that in chapter two. Um, the man from Barnes and Noble is listening with fascination. I think he's going to read the book. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Anyway, um, uh, chapter five is called The Three Martini Lunch and Other Vices. I think the other vices are actually the more interesting than the three martinis. But um, the you know, people always ask, did we indeed have three martini lunches every day? A lot of the men did. My friend Jerry Della from Nina said, yes, we went out for lunch every day. We began with three martinis, and we ended with rusty nails. You're, you're not a rusty nail crowd. I didn't know what a rusty nail was either. It's a lethal combination of scotch and dram bouillie. And I said, but Jerry, how could you guys start with three martinis and end up with rusty nails and go back to work at 2 o'clock? He said, I think what saved us is we didn't have wine. <laughs> and women did not go out for three martini lunches every day. One, I think we had a, a, a work ethic that said somebody had to stay at the office and be around there in case the client called at 2.15 and needed anything. And two is we, we didn't have the money yet because we were being paid about a third of, of what the men were being paid. And we didn't have credit cards. No credit card company, and there were only two. It was the American Express and Diners Club. No credit card company uh, gave a woman a credit card unless you were married and your husband got it for you when you were his adjunct. I didn't get an American Express card until 1975 when I was working at Ogilvy on the American Express account. <laughs> and all the account people uh, got, got American Express cards because David Ogilvy insisted on it. And so as a woman, I had one of the first American Express cards, and that was a mistake. You know, <laughs> American Express didn't really need to be that. But, so we waited until usually Friday when women were invited by the guys to come out. And we would have one or maybe two martinis. And I don't know how anybody got anything done uh, after it. But the other, the other vice that was going on, how many of you have ever watched Mad Men? Oh, mostly you're a bad man, uh, and you know you know about the smoking. I mean, every, everybody smokes everywhere all the time, right? And that's true. That that's how it was in the '60s. We smoked everywhere and all the time. Uh, in one of the very early episodes of Mad Men, Peggy Olsen goes to her gynecologist to get birth control pills, and he is smoking in the examining room. <laughs> in the examining room, not his office, in the examining room. And I thought that was just terrible. I was really, I was really uh, shocked by that. And then I remember when my first, my first daughter was born, uh, the nurse carried this little, you know, hour old five pound infant into me in my bed in New York hospital. And I cradled her tenderly in one hand and smoked the Marlboro. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, oh, no, no, don't get, get off your high horse. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, I remember at Ogilvy, uh, we all, my, my little creative group of about eight people, 
we decided we were going to quit smoking, uh, mostly because our spouses had quit. And we thought, we have enough, we have just as much willpower as they do. And so we hired some kind of motivational behaviorist or behavioral motivationist or whatever he was called. Anyway, he came in for three weeks. And on the, 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 the third week, he told us to throw away our cigarettes before we went to bed, and we would quit happily, and we would never smoke again. So um, I went home, I threw away my cigarettes, um, I got up the next morning, and any of you who have quit uh, know how it does. I woke up the next morning with a cracking headache, and I fought with my darling husband, I scolded my children, I kicked the dog, and I went down to hold the deal. <laughs> That's terrible. And I thought, oh my God, maybe I better check with the other the other people in my group because uh, if they're all feeling as terrible as I do, we're not going to get much great creative work done. Um, so I went into the first office. Uh, Mary Ann, terrific copywriter, has her head down in her typewriter and she's sobbing. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, she looks up at me and tears are streaming down her face and she says, I don't think I'll ever write another word of copy as long as you know. I'll never write another word. I said, no, no. So I go into the next office, and that's our best, our best art director. Art director. It's now 9:15 in the morning, and he is gloriously drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and he says to me, I don't, I don't miss smoking. I, don't miss smoking. <laughs> I said, no, okay, I think you should go home. <laughs> and then. In the next office, Peter Hochstein is typing. He has his back to me, he's turned around, but you know, we had those big clunky old typewriters. You don't remember them, but anyway, <laughs> Peter's typing. And I said, Peter, you're okay. And he turned around and he's sucking the baby pacifier. <laughs> <laughs> not one of us, not one of us actually ended up quitting uh, at that point. I think we all quit ultimately. I know I went to something called Smoke Enders about 20 years later, managed to quit. And I said, the day that I quit at Smoke Enders, I said, if I live to be 70 years old, I'm going to buy a carton of Marlboros and smoke them all on the same day. <laughs> I was 80 in uh, last March, and thank God I don't want a cigarette. <laughs> But I did have a glass of wine before lunch. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm going to leave some time. Uh, pot smoking. Pot smoking. One of the vices that you'll need in chapter five. Uh, now, everybody was very candid with me about sex in the office. They were candid about the three martini lunches and candid about a lot. Now, one person out of the more than 200 I interviewed actually admitted to ever smoking pot. And yet I knew there was pot smoking going on at all. Uh, because I, I just knew there was. Not a lot. But then when I went to work at Wells Retreat, which was kind of considered the creative outpost of Madison Avenue, I knew there was a lot of pot smoking going on, <laughs> particularly in the creative area. <laughs> the elevators stopped on the creative floor and we stepped out. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, madam, you're you're nodding. <laughs> anyway, anyway, this I, so so you know the Wells Retreat experience stood me in very good stead with my two teenage daughters uh, in New York. Uh, like like all of their friends began to smoke pot. They came home from school. Their friends gathered. Uh, and, and they would get into their bedrooms and smoke pot. And I come home from my office, open the door of our New York apartment, and go, ah, oh. yep. And I say to my daughters, uh, your mother is not little Nell from the country, my darling. I work in an advertising agency. You know, I know what you're doing. And anyway, my younger daughter, Jennifer, told me that her friends thought I was a terrific mom. They wish that their mothers were, you know, as cool as Jennifer's mom. Jennifer's best friend took her aside and said, Jen, your mom is so cool. I bet your mom smokes pot. <laughs> and Jennifer was indignant. She said, my mother does not smoke pot. 
And then she realized that she needed to protect my cool image. So she said, I think my mom drops acid. <laughs> I have a lot to live up to. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, the Huffington Post aside, I mean, I really have my work cut out for you. Uh, how about some questions? And I'll try to the best of my ability to answer them within reason, right? <laughs> yes, did, you, did you work on some campaigns that, uh, I mean, that went nationwide that we we know about? I mean, any. Any taglines or anything like that okay, that we, we recognize? Um, I think my favorite campaign has to be I Love New York. I, I think you're, you're even here, in, even here in Louisiana, you're aware of I Love New York. Yeah. You know, the I Heart NY. Yeah. You know, they, a, a lot of people worked on that campaign. It was almost magical that it, it suddenly burst forth. It wasn't, it didn't end up being the first. The first commercial that we presented to the client in storyboard form said, New York, New York, it's a wonderful state. The mountains are fine and the lakes are great. And he said, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we went back to the drawing board and uh, came up with uh, a simple little commercial with people from other states coming to New York City, uh, coming to New York State, sorry. So you'd have somebody fishing saying, I'm from New Hampshire, but I love New York. And somebody horseback riding, I'm from South Carolina, but I love New York. And, and then our theme one was New York, the outdoor state, because the research said that that was it. Um, and then the great designer Milton Glaser came in and looked at the rough cut and <coughs> ignored New York, the outdoor state, and just glommed onto uh, I love New York, I love New York, and designed that I heart and Y logo. And the state of New York paid him one dollar. Oh, wow. I know. Isn't that amazing? It's probably one of the most, one of the five or six, you know, most famous logos in the world. Um, and so the whole thing, you know, there are a lot of men walking around the state of New York today who will look you in the eye and tell you they're the father of I love New York. I can stand here and look you in the eye and tell you I'm its only mother. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking that. I also had my share of real clunkers, like the time I went down to the Mexico City Zoo to film a polar bear eating frozen Milky Way. <laughs> the, frozen, the, the, the bear didn't like the frozen Milky Way. <laughs> well, what we had to do to get the bear to eat the frozen Milky Way, I will leave unsaid. <laughs> Jane, you have a question? Yes, please, where is it? So, having always been on the client side, I know we can be challenging. Oh, you're a beloved client, yes. yes. <laughs> tell, tell us about one of your most challenging clients and why. Most challenging clients? Yeah, I can easily tell you that. I worked for seven months for Leona Helmsley. Oh. <laughs> uh, don't believe everything you read about Leona. She was worse than that. <laughs> she was a real bitch. <laughs> if, if I presented creative work to Leona and she didn't like it, She'd drop it on the floor and stamp on it. And I said, I just she don't like that. <laughs> uh, I, the reason I lasted for seven months was uh, she had asked me to set up an agency for her. I left Wells Retreating for this. And, uh, and uh, I took a, a, just a few people out of very good, steady jobs. And so I was hanging in by my by my fingernails to make this thing work because I, I was worried about these people. But by the end of seven months, I couldn't do it anymore and I closed down the agency, gave everybody three months uh, and, and that was that. But a friend of mine said, you lasted with Leona for seven months? You know, that's the gestation period of a pig. <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> it allows me to vent. <laughs> there was a question over here somewhere. I, I, I have one. I want to know what are you doing now? Where what am I doing now? I'm hanging by the fingernails. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what am I doing now? You know, it's it's if you live long enough and stay healthy, you get the chance to do anything. I'm having such a good time. I'm I'm doing 
I'm doing a lot of book talks still, but I'm winding down. I'm not going to do any, I don't think, in 2013, uh, unless I do a comeback. <laughs> uh, and I'm doing uh, seminars, and a couple of people uh, uh, who are here today came to my workshops at the ANA. I'm still doing those all over the country, marketing workshops, how to get advertising, you know, how to get creative work that really builds your business uh, overnight and builds your brand over time. And I do those, and I love that. And I have a number of clients uh, that, that I'm doing marketing for. Uh, for instance, um, the Brown Foreman people in, in Louisville, Kentucky, the people who make Jack Daniels, my favorite client. I don't have any, I don't have any examples with me, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, so, and I have a beau. Uh, uh, who's a professor emeritus of English literature at Bucknell University. He lives in Lewisburg. He's still teaching a course, so I can't go and live in Lewisburg. And I, because he's teaching, he won't come and, and, and live in New York. And we decided not to be married. We're just going to live in sin. <laughs> and we said, you know, he comes to me and I go to him. And so I am, I am having a really, really Wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you for asking that nice question. All right, maybe let's see. I promise we'll finish here by a couple of minutes before one. Yes, please. So if uh, somebody is going to write a book about advertising in New York today, in a few years, what what's that going to be like? It's going to be boring. <laughs> <laughs> Compared to yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, truly, what's happening is. There's not any time for three martini lunches or even sex in the office, God help us all. Um, because what's happening is the advertising agencies are getting smaller and smaller and fewer people are doing more work. Uh, and unfortunately, from what I see with my friends working in agencies, is they're, they're a little bit scared because clients are not, and present company accepted is your client. Uh, Clients, by and large, are not as loyal as they used to be. And it used to be, you know, if the advertising wasn't working, they'd say, I think we need a new campaign. And today, if the advertising isn't working, it's all too easy for the client to say, I think we need a new agency. And I worry that a lot of people in the advertising business, on the client side and on the agency side, are running a little bit scared. And scared people don't do great breakthrough creative work. Um, so uh, I think it's temporary. I think we're going to see the pendulum swing back again, and there'll be another, you know, revolution like 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 the one in the in the '60s. Uh, you know, when 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 Doyle Lane Birdback uh, was doing the advertising for Volkswagen and called it a lemon and said, "Think small." And doing the, the the great campaign for Avis, saying Avis is only number two. We have to try harder. It was the first time in the history of advertising that anybody admitted its brand was other than number one. So this this was really taking taking your brand with a little bit of humor and a little grain of salt, and saying it was not quite the holy grail. Was was just a real real breakthrough. So uh, that was it. Last question over here. What is your favorite campaign that's running right now? That, that's hard. I, I think there are two. Am I allowed to? No, not to equivocate. Um, uh, I, I think what MasterCard is doing with Priceless is so wonderful because they're in their 13th year of this Priceless campaign. Uh, and it's what I call preemptive advertising. American Express could easily have taken that positioning 13 years ago, saying it's not the thing you buy, it's the experience, the enriching experience. It's not buying the tickets for the baseball game to take your 11-year-old son that's sitting there next to your 11-year-old son and, and, you know, at the game. Uh, and they have had the guts to hang in there with this priceless campaign for 13 years. And I'm watching they keep, they keep enriching it and enriching it. And then the other campaign, the campaigns that I like are what they've been doing at the Martin Agency with Geico, because they keep doing new campaigns, but they're all doing exactly the same thing. They're zinging in that, do we really save you money? Uh, 
uh, when, when they were doing those wonderful camp, wonderful commercials with, uh, you know, it was ably and honest. Did, did the Waltons take too long to say goodbye? Uh, did the little pig really say wee 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 all the way up? Kill that little pig, you know. And, uh, and, and so I think it's a reminder to us all of the importance of just you know being single-minded and repeating, repeating, repeating in as many entertaining and persuasive ways as we can. What our what our key selling proposition is, and you guys have been just. Wonderful, and I wish I could stay. Invite me back. Will you invite me back? Sure. Yes. Yes.